Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Made For More podcast. I am very excited to have a guest with me, Rosie Bartlett. So hello, Rosie, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Ali. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. So before we get too far into it, Rosie, uh, tell me a little bit about where you've come from and where you're going. How did you get started doing what you do? Okay, so I knew from about when I was about an adolescent that I always wanted to be in the mental health and drug and alcohol sector. Um, Growing up with a family member with a drug dependency led me to a real passion to want to work in this area. Um, I decided pretty quickly, though, I didn't want to be clinical. uh, And I decided I wanted to focus on the prevention and early intervention of these problems rather than the actual treatment of when they become an issue. So... Um, After finishing uni, I decided to leave Adelaide and go for a uh, trip up to Dubbo of all places in New South Wales. And I was working for the health service there, um, enhancing the community's mental health and uh, drug and alcohol health promotion there. And funnily enough, one of my first uh, job roles was as a good sports officer trying to help the regional remote um, sporting clubs to learn to drink responsibly. Now we're talking about, you know, 15, 20 years ago now. So we've certainly come a long way, but it was a it was a nice challenge to jump head in. Um, So as part of that job, I was trained in this thing called mental health first aid, which I'd never heard of before. Yeah. And I quickly learned that I was really passionate about that. So Without telling you my long uh, history of where I've worked and bits and pieces, the mental health first aid has always remained as a real sort of integral part of what I do. And after having my second child, I decided that I wanted to jump into business, which is now what I do, um, not only mental health first aid, but a whole range of different programs that sort of sit along the spectrum of keeping people well, um, helping people who perhaps are struggling a little bit, and then that intervention when people actually are um, experiencing mental health problems. So I love the training. I love meeting people. I love, um, you know, embedding learning outcomes and seeing those light bulb moments. And I think given last year in particular with everything that's happened, I think mental health is really at the forefront of people's minds um, given their experience. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I'm a huge fan of the work you do. I think it's one of those areas where, you know, we know that we need to be doing it, but there's always, you know, what you know and what you're actually doing are two very separate things. So for those uh, that are people that are listening, um, I mean, usually we think about mental health around people that have mental health conditions, but can you unpack a little bit more around mental health first aid? Sure. So mental health first aid is essentially the help that we give to people who are either developing a mental health problem, experiencing a worsening of a mental health problem, or who are in a crisis situation. So something like suicidal thoughts and behaviours or panic attacks or severe psychotic states. And I think we traditionally think of physical health and mental health as two very separate things, but they are very closely entwined and we can experience medical conditions with our physical selves and our mental health state as well. And mental health first aid really has a strong focus on that early intervention. Um, The sooner we get somebody help, the sooner that we um, can hopefully have them on some sort of path to recovery. But essentially, if you think of physical first aid and what the purpose of that is, Um, you know, to preserve life and to make people comfortable until the professionals arrive. That's pretty much what mental health first aid looks at from that side of things. You're not a professional. You're not designed to treat. You're not now um, responsible for that person. Um, It really is that sort of that that assistance that we can give, those conversations we can have, and then Mm. the connection to professional help if actually needed. Yeah, I love this so much because I think, you know, what we're hearing more and more now, especially in Australia, is, you know, we've got this RUOK day, um, gets a lot of, you know, gets a lot of media attention, but it's essentially, you know, only one day a year. And then we kind of got into this like, yeah, okay, I'm going to ask my friends if they're okay. And that's what everyone's telling me to do. But, you know, my mate Johnny over here has just said, actually, no, they're not okay. And then we're like, oh, shit, like now, now what do we do? So, yeah, that's right. So I think we're like educated now around knowing that mental health is a thing that pops up in our workplaces and that's predominantly where you work within organisations. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I have a real focus on um, 
creating and I guess developing mentally healthy workplaces so you know yeah. mental health first aid is certainly a component of that but it is also about embedding that in the workplace making sure that there is um, good policy that in place to back that up support for people in the workplace and really looking as I said along that spectrum because I think traditionally we have sort of said this person has a mental illness we'll put them in a box over here yeah. Um, whereas I don't have a mental illness, so I'm in the box over there. And it's very black or white thinking, you know, it's sort mm-hmm. of like us versus them mentality. Yeah. Yeah. When realistically, it's something that we all sit along depending on what's happening for us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can you can be healthy, you can be well and sort of really sitting up in that side that uh, you feel resilient and you're able to, you know, you feel confident, able to make those decisions. But we all move along the continuum depending on what's happening for us. And yeah you know stress and 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 workloads and things like that can push us you know further down towards the other end yeah um so it really is about trying to create that uh you know more holistic view that it's not just about training um it's about yeah. actually you know building a culture yeah i love it i love I love, love, love the work that you do. So you, <laughs> you know, you said about 15 years ago, we'll go with 15. Um, you know, you started around that uh, in Dubbo area and you're looking at, you know, the health and well-being of uh, staff there, but specifically around, you know, drug and alcohol use and drinking responsibly, probably not using drugs in the workplace. From what was deemed as like mental health back then, where it was, you know, drug and alcohol driven or the effects of drug and alcohol driven compared to what's, what you're seeing now within organisations, what's been the shift or the transition that's happened over time? I think a big shift and a big transition is exactly what you were saying before. I think initially it used to be those sort of more tokenistic things of, yeah, you were celebrating a mental health week here or, yeah, you were having a, you know, are you okay day here? But realising that that's not good enough, Mm. that one day a year or that one week of a year isn't good enough. We should be having these conversations year long round and we should be equipping equipping people with the skills to have these conversations because here's the thing, it is just a conversation. But yeah. for some reason, people shy away from this or they, you know, think, oh, we don't want to meddle or, you know, overstep a mark. But it is actually just a conversation. And it's about, yeah, giving people those skills to be able to have them. Yeah. Um, and also to learn how to push below the social politeness that people have. You know, any tea yeah. room across Australia, you sit there and like, morning, how are you? And someone goes, good, thanks. It's about going, actually, how are you really? Because yeah. I've noticed X, Y, and Z, and I, you know, I care, and I just want to know what's going on for you. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, last year was has been a huge, dare I say it, pivot point for a lot of businesses. Of course, yeah, <laughs> no, I did it out loud. Um, but I think what I certainly noticed with the leaders and organisations that I was working with was that conversation happened. So it's almost like we needed to get away from each other <laughs> and get online. Hello, Zoom, to be able to go. Oh yeah, how you doing? And oh yeah, yeah, no, no, like how are you really? This is me checking you in. So it kind of took a global pandemic or a massive crisis for people to start being like, actually, you know. I really deeply care about my my people, my staff, um, those that are working with me. So what are you seeing now? Is that Was that just kind of a once-off knee-jerk reaction or do you think that that is going to be something that's here to stay now that we care a bit more deeply? I hope it's here to stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, there, there's been a lot of bad things or, you know, negative things or cons that have come out of a global pandemic, but there's also been some really fantastic things and I think... Yeah bringing the forefront of people's mental health, you know, for people to start thinking about that is one of those. I, I think now it's, it, it, the Pandora's box has been open. I don't think it can be closed again. Um, it's just shined such an important spotlight on these issues. And I think now workplaces are realising more and more that they not only have a work health safety requirement in regards to physical health, but also yeah. to people's psychological safety and, you know, to reduce that, that, that mitigate that risk around um, around mental health because if your people aren't happy and healthy physically and mentally, you're not going to get the best out of them. And mm, mm. it's not. It, I think also too, it's not even just about the team's mental health, but it's also about brand reputation. To be honest, yeah. um, talk I think, to me more about that. Well, organisations that have a good brand reputation, they generally attract the best staff, retain the best staff. 
I'm sure that there's been a job out there, Ali, that one time has been mentioned to you and you hear that particular organisation and you go, no, thank you. you. (laughs) Simply just based on what people say. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You know, it's up to an organisation to want to hire the best people, but it's also the people that that choose the the best organisations. A hundred percent. And I think this is going to be one of those things, you know, here we go, we'll be futurists before we know it. This is going to be one of those things that I think, um, you know, staff retention is going to be massive over the next couple of years because people are going to, you know, we've had this kind of wake up moment and people that have been going to their nine to five job or whatever it happens to be have gone, you know, what? Well, actually I wasn't super happy. And we're going to see a big shift in terms of, um, you know, staff workplaces. And I think you're exactly Exactly right. People are going to go, okay, well, what what are people or what are organizations offering that's going to be able to support my uh, my mental health, my mental health and well-being? What have we got on offer? And what is their, you know, policy, process, procedure, whatever it happens to be around that? Are you seeing the beginnings of that happening already? Yeah, look, there's some organizations that are light years ahead of others. There are some yeah. organizations that have all of this in place. And I've worked with some absolutely amazing large corporations that are truly committed to this stuff yeah. and truly mean it. It's not just ticking a box. It's not yeah. just going, okay, well, we have some training. They really want to embed embed that in there. But for others, like it's a journey that I think we are all on. And it's not, yeah. again, it's not black and white. You don't just go and they go, okay my job and my passion lies in creating mentally healthy workplaces, but you don't just sit there and walk in and assume that an organization hasn't already taken some of those steps. And it is going to depend on past experiences, whether it's more proactive or reactive. Um, But I do think more and more organizations are seeing this, you know, and, and, and not even specific targeted mental health type initiatives or training or investment in that also just in the whole, okay, work-life balance, flexibility, what's work-life balance? I don't know. I don't know if anyone has a good definition of it, but (laughs) it's about... call it the blend. (laughs) Yeah, but it's about going, well, shit, like people can work from home and they can be productive and some people are more productive working from home. For others, it's not the right environment and that's okay. But rather than viewing everybody through one lens or through that sort of black or white filter, it's about a, a tailored response to get the best out of your people, to get the best out of your assets. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is so true. And I think there's definitely not one size fits all. And uh, there's definitely a lot of room now to have that kind of conversation around, okay, well, what are we what are we trying to do at the end of the day? You know, be more productive or be more efficient, whatever the measure happens to be. You know, how do we get that from our staff, whether they're in, in an office, um, in an office building, whether they're working from home, whether it's a hybrid model, whatever it happens to be. And are you noticing or have you heard from your um, past clients and organisations that you've worked with that when we talk about happy and healthy um, workplaces and happy and healthy people is their productivity and their um, efficiencies are they better performers when they're happy and healthy absolutely yep so not only do you have studies and data to back um, that back this up um, price waterhouse coopers a few years ago did a return on investment study which shows a clear dollar amount minimum two dollars thirty for every dollar spent great take back and that's for some industries we you think about things like mining industry yep. you're looking more like five six dollars per dollar so yeah. we have the actual studies and the productivity commission has also just released a report on um on mental health so that's another one that you have clear data that sits there that's so but, good anecdotally just talking to the organizations um and getting a sense of that like they already feel that without the data you know you invest mm-hmm. in your people and they want to bring the best result back because they feel cared about yeah um i did some work with a very very big large retail chain um well, i still do a bit of work with them and i was getting my groceries and i was having a conversation with a with a girl at the checkout and she asked me what I do and I said oh yeah this is you know I train and I've actually done your store manager in mental health first aid and and she just said to me she goes oh I had some anxiety um, earlier this year and it was just handled so perfectly and I felt so supported and I was just like oh my god like one one of those huge moments where you're like I love what I do like I'm actually making a difference you know we're training management but it's filtering down to yeah. you know the people on the who are at the coal face who are actually having that customer interaction in this particular instance. So yeah, yeah, it was it was one of those moments where I go, oh, I like what I do, <laughs> I love oh. what I do. 
That is so good. So I talk, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, the flow on or the waterfall effect that leaders have. And this is a perfect example for what, you know, happens at the top. And and then when we start, you know, really empowering leaders to be invested in these types of things and invested in their people and the waterfall happens and you got to see it firsthand at the checkout. And that is just such a great story. And also, you know, obviously it's helped that person as well with whatever mental health um, issues they were having at that particular time. That is so cool. I love it. I love it, love it. Love it. So tell me a little bit more around, you know, when we're talking about um, happy and healthy workplaces, what do you think, what do you think we're going to be seeing in the future? Like if, if uh, our listeners are going, okay, well, does that mean we do morning tea every day? Morning tea makes me pretty happy, especially if there's something with sprinkles for sure. But like, what does that actually look like in terms of, you know, like a sustainable day to day workplace? Firstly, I don't think it's cookie cutter and I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all approach. Um, it's going to depend on industry. It's going to depend on, you know, workforce. And I think it depends also too on your demographics of that particular workforce, you know, older, younger, more male, female orientated. Um, so I think yeah, it's no, no one size fits all there. But what I think we will sort of see is, as I said, a bit more of a whole organisation thing, like running a morning tea is great, um, yeah. but it's not going to, it's the same as, you know, our wellness committee decided we're going to run yoga at lunchtime. Like that's that's great, but it's it can't be a standalone thing. Like it needs to encompass all of those things along that spectrum I was talking about. So firstly, keeping your people well, making sure that they stay well and, you know, yoga and that type of thing, they're great initiatives, but as I said, standalone, not so great. Then having the ability to recognise as somebody is not themselves and trying to get there as quick as you can to work out, you know, do they need a little bit of time off or perhaps we need to rethink their workload or, you know, and a very, um, a conversation that's very two way in that respect. Yeah. And then if people have sort of managed to keep that mask up and are actually struggling a little bit more than what they are letting on, well, yeah. how do we actually connect them to the right people that they need, you know, through employee assistance programs? you know, that type of thing, or what can we do as a workplace to practically support this person? And Mm. then if somebody is unwell, well, what do we need to do to manage that process? So it really sits along that spectrum. Yeah. Uh, The same way if you think like, you know, somebody had a back injury or, you know, broken leg or something, like if their back back is just starting to niggle, what do we do? Like, do we change their duties for a bit so that they can, you know, get better and be back feeling, you know, tip top or... If their back's aching a lot more, you know, maybe we need to connect them to a physio or something like that. Or, But if they've really broken their back, what do we need to do to get them back? So I think it's, yeah, it's 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 looking at not just one end of it. It, it, it really is a big, bigger picture. Do you know, it's so interesting that you say that exact example. I was listening to a podcast last night and it was around men- mental health, you know, in preparation for today. Um, but one of the examples was, you know, like when, we, when we're hurting, if we've got a headache, if we've got a backache, we'll take some, you know, paracetamol or we'll take something called we'll go and see a doctor and be like, I've got this physical pain, I want it to stop. Whereas we're far more tolerable to any of the mental pain or the mental uncomfortableness if that's a word, it is now, um, that we experience. And it's interesting that we don't treat them equally the same. Like, you know, I want to get this fixed. I want to get this solved. I want to find a better way. So what do you, what advice do you have for people that are, you know, yes, that just take some Panadol or some paracetamol for a sore head, <laughs> sore head, sore back. What, what would be sort of, you know, your immediate first aid for someone who's either got a nickel or got a bit more than a nickel? Stop and recognize it yeah don't keep powering on you wouldn't try to keep walking on a broken leg would you no you'd stop (laughs) and and get the help that you need I think so much stigma still sits out in the community both internal stigma of you know I must be strong enough to deal with this I must be you know I'm useless if I can't but that external stigma of what is my workplace going to think about this or what are my colleagues going to think about this and you know through a lot of the training I do, it is around that normalisation and people understanding that one in two of us will meet the diagnostic criteria for a mental illness at some point in our lives. Like one in two of us, like that's wow, you know. that is <laughs> staggering. And so it's time to start talking about this more. It's time to start being more vulnerable with people and understanding that everybody sits along this spectrum. No one gets to stay, you know, up in the green and healthy all the time. It's just not yeah. the reality. 
Yeah. Uh, we're not robots. So talk about it more, be vulnerable more, have, you know, those, the way I see it, it's like the longer you walk down a path, the longer it takes to turn around and walk back. Ignoring <laughs> it doesn't make it go away, you know, like, yeah. and it's not like you can walk down a path and then just jump in an Uber and go back to being well again. Like yeah. the longer yeah. these things are left, more often than not, the worse that they end up. And the more exhausted the person ends up being by trying to just keep that happy face going and that mask up that we all wear from time to time. So very long winded. My, <laughs> my well, I think advice. that's a beautiful metaphor. Like the longer the longer you go down the path, the longer it's going to take you to come back when you turn around. Like that's that's great. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. And yeah. even if it isn't a mental illness, even if it is just a period of stress or a shitty time in your life or whatever it might be, what can you put in place to make sure you're looking after yourself? up yeah. your self-care say yeah. no yeah have your boundaries put yourself first yeah yeah I love that so much so speaking of self-care what's your go-to self-care regime <laughs> well I'm an extrovert Ali um a little bit are you? you are you oh my goodness <laughs> um and because I spend so much of my day with other people or when I'm at home I have little children attached to my legs Often I really like to practice self-care by myself. <laughs> I quite like to go and read a book and recharge my batteries or exercise is another one that is, is huge for me. I know if I'm not exercising, I see my stress and my irritability start to rise a little bit more um, than usual. So exercise is a big one. Recharging my batteries and just being alone with no yep. noise. Yep. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, but I also too make sure that self-care is not just in one dimension i think self-care is very multifaceted and we sometimes neglect certain parts of our self-care and what i mean by that is it can look physical through things like exercise and yoga and whatnot it can look um spiritual so you know meditation or religion if that's what somebody finds um is for them connection with others Yep. So actually taking the time to connect with those around us, not just be around us, connect. Yeah. yeah. Put away technology. Um, you know, talk to your family. <laughs> Ring a friend that you haven't spoken to in forever. But yeah. self-care can also look like learning. It can yeah. look like growth and learning. Um, it, yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is that if you're listening to this and thinking about your self-care, do consider about what other dimensions you could potentially boost um in that area because yeah. I think it's really important as I said that we don't just look at it as one thing yeah I've never really looked at it as, as um you know multi multifaceted in different dimensions and like you know and I, I'm a big practicer of self-care but self-care you know I think there's this stigma that it has to be day spas and something luxurious whereas I you know live close to the beach and luckily um self-care to me is again an alone walk on the beach because that's important but it doesn't need to be bells and whistles. It doesn't need to be expensive. It doesn't need to be, you know, a uh, entourage of, you know, events or activities. But I've never thought about it from different dimensions around that physical, that spiritual, um, that connection aspect. I love that. I think that's amazing. Yeah. <sighs> what do you, your walks on the beach. I'm going to interview you now. <laughs> Um, what is your self-care walks on the beach or anything else or yeah so mine is I uh, meditate every day so that's a big big thing for me because you know you would know that you're very similar there, there's a lot of kids in my house there's a lot of noise my brain gets a little bit blah, blah, blah. Um, and obviously there's a lot going on as well in business life in home life so uh, meditation every day is really important for me just to stop my brain from <laughs> burning out uh and then yeah physical for me but I I love the beach I love the smell of it I love the feel of it it's very much a grounding activity getting out getting fresh air um and I do like to do it by myself so that I don't have to carry kilos and kilos of shells um and then I get a lot very similar to you being extroverted I get a lot of recharge just purely by being around people so by default in my job I'm you know automatically recharged expend, expending energy and uh recharging all all at the same time so yes but I'm a big big believer in in recharging your energy especially as a leader you know we're so responsible for the energy and how we show up to our teams to our people you and I both you know 
stand up in in rooms full of people all the time like it's really important that we're giving them 100% I can't give 100% if I'm not making sure this analogy of your oxygen mask being filled up I can't give if my cup's empty all of those uh, metaphors uh, that we hear all the time it's it's actually very true when you start thinking about what it is for you I completely agree with you and I think though too often we put ourselves last yes and you know not stereotyping saying it's only mothers fathers can be like that as well but I I find personally within my experience as a mother it's like I say yes to everybody else but myself sometimes yeah (laughs) because there's things that need to be done and it's like I can't just put myself first all the time I've got two two tiny well not tiny children tiny dictators I was going to say in my house you know I've got a husband I've got a family you know all of I've got work I've got business to run all of those things and it is about, I think, really importantly scheduling it because if you don't schedule it, it won't happen. Yep. And sometimes it doesn't happen still because life happens. But actually putting a time and a place to that, I think, is super important yeah. uh, because otherwise it's like saying to someone, oh, let's have that meeting sometime. <laughs> you don't actually say <laughs> where. It's, yeah. I'm sure you can all think of that friend that you're like, yep, we'll catch up soon. Yeah. And you're like, oh, we should catch up soon. And it happens again. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It's all around that intention. And I find, you know, if I'm scheduling something out that whether it's meditation, whether it's walk on the beach, if I'm like, this is my chance to recharge my batteries and refill my cup, that's the whole point of it is very different to me just going for like a wander down the road, down the beach. So I think it does come with like, what am I doing this for? Oh, that's right. I'm doing this for me. And actually truly asking yourself, does it leave me feeling revived and refreshed and ready to go or have I just zoned out watching Netflix for two hours scrolling on my phone like zoning out's good zoning out is great don't get me wrong I love a good zone out but it's if that's your only form of self-care you truly have to ask yourself is it leaving me refreshed revived ready to go it's like some people go oh you know I'll go home and have a couple of glasses of wine it's like hey it's nothing wrong with a glass of wine here or there but is that your only type of self-care and is it really leaving you feeling those things a hundred percent yeah I think that's it and it's all around the intention and what it's doing for you so oh so so good yes self-care uh so tell me then I know you mentioned earlier or just before around boundaries I love talking about boundaries tell me what you meant when you were saying um you know part of your own self-care is around having boundaries talk to me about that learning how to say no Uh Not only in your professional life, but in your personal life too. I think we get often quite so caught up in um, saying yes, that it comes to our detriment at times and we take too much on and then we don't have any time or nothing left for ourselves. But I also think from a leader's perspective, it is also having boundaries in place with the people who you work with and What I mean by that is, you know, we all, you know, I think important part of getting to know your people is to getting to know them. But that boundary in place of particularly providing mental health first aid, what is your responsibility and what is your not? Is not your responsibility? Like it's not your responsibility to save someone. There's a level of personal responsibility that sits there with the person and you can't keep jumping in and trying to fix them or to save them. You'll burn yourself out. Absolutely, yeah. burn yourself out. Where's that boundary of, yes, okay, I can provide support to you at work, but when you go home, who else do you have that's a support? So you're not getting com- you know, calls at all hours of the night and you know, setting those boundaries there and being really clear that I care about you. Um, this, is, this is not me saying that I don't care, but you need to have these other sources of support there. And you know, here's my arm. You can take it if you'd like. If you want yeah. some help or you want me to connect you, here's the arm. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I need to take that arm away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't pull me in the hole. Correct. Yeah. So easy yeah. to pull out. Uh, speaking of leaders, what are your top five tips for leaders around, I guess, happy and healthy or mental health? You tell me. What have you, what have you All got? Right. Okay. Well, I was thinking, because you mentioned this to me yesterday, I was thinking about this last night and I struggled to only stick with five. I know. I should do the top 80. 80 yes, yes. <laughs> and we could have a podcast that runs for three hours. <laughs> we'll do episode um, two next. <laughs> well, I suppose one of those things is what we're talking about, prioritise that self-care. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so important. You 
cannot be the best leader. You cannot be the best version of yourself if you do not prioritise that self-care. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, probably leading off of that other one that we just spoke about, don't jump in and try and save someone. Yeah. Um, put everything you can to support that person, um, but don't jump in the hole because mm. it's an outcome that you actually can't control. And as I said, you'll end up burning yourself out and your mental health will um, will suffer as a result of that. Yeah. Um, I guess focus on keeping people well, not just on reacting. Yeah, love it. Um, and understand as part of that, if you're noticing some things in relation to performance or people's interactions with others in the workplace, don't start with the big stick, you know, you've been <laughs> late or, you know, this, this KPI isn't met or whatever. Look, performance management has to be done. And that's probably a side tip of that, that performance yeah. management has to be done. Like don't ignore it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not the best place to start. Yep. The best place to start is a how are you conversation, looking at the why of those things are happening yep. rather than the fact these things are happening. Now, if they keep happening, <laughs> then they need to be addressed and they need to be addressed early. Too many people ignore it and, yep. you know, put it away and, and it rears its ugly head because nothing's been done about it. So yeah. performance manage if necessary, but start with the why and start with the person yeah. and make clear it's not about work it's about you yeah um and have that conversation early that's probably another side tip I don't know how many I'm up to yet but have the conversation early don't wait until it becomes a problem yeah talk to people you yeah. know it doesn't need to be a perfect conversation it needs to be a good enough conversation and just a how are you going you know I've noticed that you, know, you have been late a couple of times this week is everything okay mm -hmm. Just a bit out of character for you, you know. What yeah. is anything going on? How can I help? Love it. And I think you just said an absolute nugget of gold there. It doesn't need to be a perfect conversation, it needs to be a good enough conversation. And I think if uh if people don't take anything else away, just take that uh, that away. It doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be good enough to get something to happen. Love yeah. It. Yeah. And as part of that talk about this stuff, like talk about it. It yeah. challenges stigma. It's amazing how often when somebody starts talking about their experience or, and it doesn't need to be a full blown, like it just be, oh, I've been feeling a bit stressed lately. That allows the person next to you to be vulnerable with you and go, oh, me too. I've been really stressed out as well. I think everyone yeah. goes through, particularly in the workplace and keeps that mask up. Like it's all good. It's fine. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Like it's great. Yeah. <laughs> when somebody got... actually is vulnerable, it, it yeah. gives that person permission to go, oh, me too. I've actually been feeling a little bit you know, unmotivated or whatever it is, like that vulnerability will give um, give people permission to talk to. And that probably leads me on to my last one is that it is about having these conversations. It is honestly about advocating for developing that mentally healthy culture. Like people are our best, our best assets, yeah. 100%. And when we invest in them, they yeah. will um, invest in the workplace too. Love it. Love it. You are preaching to the converted, my friend. <laughs> Um, this has been amazing. And if we've got any of our listeners that are going, hmm, I'm not actually sure if we do have a mentally healthy workplace or not, or perhaps there's some wiggle room, you've got a bit of a, a free download for people to check out. Yes, yes. So uh, I've got a, an organisational mentally healthy checklist. So it's a bit of a place to start, a little bit of a, a, a little audit about what mentally healthy workplaces look like and uh, get you start to think, you know, do you have these things in place or are there some yeah. areas that you could potentially start off and develop? It's baby steps. Don't expect yeah. transformation overnight, but baby steps uh, are what it's all about. Yeah, I love it. I'll pop the um, the link to that into the show notes for today's episode around that organisational checkup or the audit for mentally healthy workplaces. I think it'll be a really good start for people to, you know, get that conversation happening, even with their peers as well. And uh, if anyone wants to uh, check you out online, loving what they're hearing and want to hear more, where can they find you? Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best to find me. Also on Facebook, Minds Eye Training and Consulting on LinkedIn is Minds Eye Training and Consulting and Rosie Bartlett on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with anyone who is like-minded in this area. I get so excited when I'm 
connecting with people who are passionate about this. Um, a little too excited sometimes and talk a little bit too much, but that's all good. <laughs> no, I think we are changing the way that uh, people work, which is really, really cool. Thank you so much, Rosie. Uh, I have loved this. I love I love your work, love the work that you and uh, the rest of your team do at Minds Eye Training. I think it is such an integral part and uh, definitely leading the way for the future for mentally healthy workplaces. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. I love your work too. <laughs> love fest. All right, catch you soon.